this is a year of pursuit. And uh, we can't get away from it. We began the year in spiritual pursuit uh, because we are pursuing his presence. His presence is very important uh, to us here at Fresh Start Church. This is why we come together. Because he said if two or three gather together, he would be in the midst of them. So we know he's here this morning. We've been pursuing his presence. Uh, we were committed this year to not just pursue his presence, but pursue his character. To pursue his character. And then his harvest, which we have been going after in soul pursuit. And his dreams, his dreams, his dreams. Um, what I want to deal with this morning is what I want to call, really it's, I believe, is the dream of God for his church. Um, I believe there, 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 when, you, when you talk about the church, there is what we call the universal church. The universal church would be all those that have put faith in Jesus Christ around the world, the universal church. Then there's what we call the corporate body or the corporate church. The corporate church becomes more uh, smaller in scope in that Fresh Start Church would be a corporate church, a corporate body. Okay? And so we know that there are many churches in the body of Christ, and so they are corporate churches. There's a universal church we all belong to. Then there's the corporate church where we worship on a weekly basis and where we minister and where we become a part of a family in that church. It's a corporate body. It's a corporate church. And then there would be, uh, just for a lack of, de uh, for a definition, uh, it would be the individual church, which is each one of us. Each one of us make up the church. Okay? And so I I'm, I'm just laying that out there because I believe that God has a dream for the universal church, the church worldwide. And then I believe that God, that God takes that dream and he becomes more focused and more in a smaller scope through the corporate body. That's why you can go to various churches in our city and they will have a different DNA. They'll have a different style of worship. They'll have a different emphasis it doesn't mean they've missed God or, 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 or they're, uh, you know, off track. It just means they are going after uh, the dream that God has for them. So you have the universal dream, which is for all the church. Then you have what each local church is. And that's awesome because what that does is that gives us a variety of worship, of places to worship. Amen? And, of course, that doesn't mean we go around eating off every, every church. And, 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 but we, because God brings people together of like minds, like hearts, like vision. You see, and that makes up a corporate body. All right. And so uh, so it's that's why it's varied, because not everybody in the universal body of Christ thinks the same, sees the things the same. I mean, they all love Jesus. They all have placed their faith in salvation through the cross and the blood of Jesus. But they're just a little different uh, makeup on the inside of them. Many times it's because of our background, what we've walked through, different things like that. What we were born into becomes our bent becomes what we go after. And then, and then there's the individual dream, which God has a dream over your life. God has a dream specifically for you and about you. Amen. We're going to deal with that, I'm sure, as we go along. But really, I just felt compelled today because I believe that if we can catch hold of the universal dream uh, as, as the body of Christ, we can change the world. I believe if we can tap into the dream of God, what he has for our local church, Fresh Start Church, that we can change a city. I really believe that. And I also believe if we can tap into our individual dreams, they will strengthen the dream of God over the local church. It will strengthen the dream of God uh, in, over the universal church as we all find our place going after the dream of God. Amen? And so I want to work on that a little bit this morning. And so why don't you go with me to Mark chapter 1. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here, quite a few scriptures here in Mark chapter 1. And then we're going to go to the book of Acts. And the reason I want to go to the book of Acts is I want to show you how the ministry of Jesus parallels with the ministry of the Acts church. This is very important to where we're headed uh, today. And so we'll begin reading in Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 32. At evening... 
When the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. Somebody shout, pursue God. And when they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. Whether they know it or not, everybody's looking for Jesus. Yes? But he said to them, let us go into the next town that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in the synagogues throughout all of Galilee and casting out demons. Now let's go to chapter 2 of Mark in verse 1. And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Now let's go over to Acts. Acts chapter 5. And we will begin reading in verse 12. Is this all right? And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all in one accord in Solomon's porch. And none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added... Uh, added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding city to Jerusalem bringing the sick people that those who were tormented by unclean spirits and those tormented by unclean spirits and they were all healed. They were all healed. The key to understanding the book of Acts is the first verse. Where Luke implies that the book of Acts is a continuation of the Gospels. The Gospel told us what Jesus, Luke says, began to do. And to teach. Acts tells us what he continued to do and teach through the Holy Spirit, through the church. This is important to where we're headed today. You see, I guess one reason that we here at Fresh Start Church, we are so in love with the Acts Church, is the Acts Church just did Jesus stuff. What Jesus did in the Gospels. You will find that the Acts Church was practicing and moving in the same level of ministry to the city around them. This this is so powerful to me because I think we've lost much of this in the body of Christ. And so because you see the power of the Holy Spirit working through the church is absolutely one of the most impressive things I have ever read. Uh, The book of Acts obviously is one of my favorite books. Matter of fact, Mark is my favorite gospel. The book of Acts, if I just had the book, if I had to choose three books in the Bible, it would be the Gospel of Mark, the book of Acts, and Romans. I think I could get everything I needed to touch a world out of those three books right there. Amen? And so, uh, but so the most power, the power of the Holy Spirit uh, working through the church is one of the most impressive things you will see in the book of Acts. Matter of fact, some theologians says the book of Acts should not be called the Acts of the Apostles. It should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And this is why I have come to declare in this house why the ministry of Jesus Christ shall be continued throughout history and time. Because it's not about a people. It is about the moving and the power of the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus left here, he said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he is going to come up on you and give you power. Why? So you can do what I have been doing. Somebody shout yes. And so this is important because the work of the Holy Spirit... Uh, really can't be understood completely until you bring this relationship of the Gospels uh, between the Gospels and the book of Acts together. This is what I am attempting to do uh, this morning. 
Because you see, both the public ministry of Jesus and the, and the, and the ministry of the New Testament church began with a power encounter with the Holy Spirit. Uh, when you look in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 1, Luke chapter 4, verse 1, what, what, you, what you see there is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Um, let me find it here. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, and it said, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Then drop down to verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding regions. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. This, this is what I want you uh, to, to see here, is that for 30 years, Jesus simply grew in the things of God. When it came time for him to launch into his public ministry, private ministry for 30 years, three years of public ministry but changed the world and is still changing the world today. Uh, before he was launched at his baptism, the skies opened up. The Spirit of God came down upon him and he was filled with the Spirit, it says. And then he came up out of the wilderness in power. Amen. And began his ministry to the cities in the world around him. We know Acts 1.8, uh, that, that, that they received power after the Holy Spirit came upon him to become witnesses. And so the New Testament church, uh, they were told to wait. Don't go yet. Wait until you are endued with power from on high, until you are filled with the Holy Spirit, and the power of God is working through you. Why? Because they understood that they had to complete, they had to continue the ministry of Jesus. When Jesus was on the earth, he was not just here as, as the second person of the Godhead. When he ministered, he was ministering under the influence and the power of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Somebody say yes. And so, so the, the Spirit that was on Jesus, the Holy Spirit that was in him, authorized him to preach the kingdom of God, authorized him to demonstrate the kingdom power. Uh, and, and how did he demonstrate it? He demonstrated it by healing the sick and by casting out devils, by setting the captive free, by changing lives everywhere he went through the power of his love. And so the, the point being this morning, I want to lay the foundation is, is that the same spirit of power in Acts gave the same authority to the disciples. The same spirit of power that it gave Jesus authority to heal the sick. The same spirit that gave him authority to cast out demons. That same authority came upon the church in the New Testament that they could also heal the sick and cast out demons. I'm going somewhere with this. And so the Gospels and Acts are not, not just history books. They're handbooks on how to live the spirit-filled life, how to be a spirit-filled church. They're handbooks. They guide us. They lead us uh, through ministry and life. And so as I was studying this this week, you know, when, when, you, when you get on the Internet, you come across all kinds of stuff, you know. And uh, so as I was studying this concept out, and I was doing research, I came across all kinds of things that denied what I'm teaching right now. That would refute what I'm getting ready to share with you as the body of Christ. But I have come to declare it loud and proud today. Uh, that as believers, we should desire and we should expect as the norm what we read in the Gospels and what we see in the book of Acts. This should not be something that's outrageous. This should not be something that is radical. I'm going to be radical for some today, but it shouldn't be radical. It should be the norm. We are the children of God. We've been bought with a price, filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit power and authority is available to all of us. Somebody shout yes. And so, so as, as spirit-filled believers, we should expect that all the activity that's in, in the New Testament ministry uh, should be attainable uh, for the church today, the, the church that is moving in full power. I'm after full power. Somebody shout full power. 
I have not been able to find anything uh, in the Gospels or in the book of Acts or even the epistles that tell us that the moving of the Spirit, that tell us that signs and wonders and miracles and spiritual gifts and the book of Acts standard of ministry has ceased suddenly and permanently. I can't find it. There are those that espouse that. There are those that declare that. And when I was reading their teaching and their preaching, I got quite discouraged. That didn't motivate me one bit. That didn't exhilarate me one bit. That didn't, want me, that didn't empower me to get up and go touch a city and change the world. And so I had to shut that stuff down, and I had to get back to the book. And I had to realize this, that the same spirit that was on Christ and the same spirit that was on the Acts church, that same spirit is on your life and my life and the church of Jesus Christ. So obviously I believe the opposite, and I believe the Gospels, and I believe Acts reveals to us uh, what the church must be and do in all generations. And that is to be a church that continues the ministry of Jesus Christ. Even though he died and rose again and ascended to heaven, Jesus said, I'm not through working yet. I'm not through doing what needs to be done yet. But I'm going on and I'm getting ready to transfer my ministry over to the church. Yes? Some, some call this the Acts 29 model. You know Acts 29? If you're not familiar with your Bible yet, you, sh- you, you will be. That Acts only has 28 chapters. Acts 29 means that we're living out the final pages of the book of Acts. It was never completed. It was never over. Uh, we are in that time. We are in that season. The church age is Acts 29, where God is beginning to manifest His glory and His power. And so the Holy Spirit... Uh, is reproducing the ministry of Jesus through the church. That's, that's just what I come to talk about today. Pretty simple, isn't it? But I wanted to lay this foundation down because there's so many other ideas and thoughts about what I'm sharing with you. And that Acts continues the story of how Jesus' followers were empowered with the same spirit, same power, same gospel, same miracles, same sacrifice, same life. Yes. Somebody shout Acts 29. You know, a few years ago, the big thing was WWJD. What would Jesus do? That's what I come to talk about today. If Jesus were to step down into Phoenix, Arizona, what would he do? What would he do? And Mark 1, I think, gives us an amazing, Mark 1 and Mark 2 gives us some amazing insight into what Jesus would do. If he were to come in the flesh today and move in this city, what would his hands do? What would, where would his feet go? What would his eyes see? Uh, what, what would his mouth speak? And so I want to go back to Mark. I want to go back to Mark chapter 1. And I want to spend the rest of our time here because this, just, this week this just came off the pages to me as, as I was reading uh, through the gospel of Mark. And uh, so, so the, uh, Mark here in chapter 1 gives us a day. Everybody shout a day. A day in the ministry of Jesus. I mean, Jesus, man, he, he was on the move. Jesus was very active. Uh, Jesus, he had come to seek and to save those that were lost. He was not passive. He was a man of action. Uh, and so, so if the church is going to take up the ministry of Jesus, we too must be people of action. And so let's, let's begin at the end of his day. And really, it blended over from the end of a day to the beginning of a day. And because we can, we can really make an assertion that this is how Jesus ended and began every day. And it's found in, in, in Mark Uh, verse 35 and it said now in the morning having risen a long while before daylight he went out and departed to a solitaire place and there he prayed and so if the church is going to minister like jesus then you know what we're gonna have uh to pray jesus prayed all of his ministry so powerful came out of his life because he prayed And he not only prayed, but he prayed alone. Uh, He went away. He, after pouring out so much the day before, Jesus understood that he had to go spend some quality time with his father that he might begin to receive more power for the task that laid ahead. Uh, I I want to encourage you today and understand as we pursue God, 
uh, he will begin to plant authority in us. Because there's two things I want to talk about Jesus today, and that he had authority and he had availability. He had authority to make a change, and he was available to make a change. Watch this. Because the, the authority begins to be born into our hearts as we develop an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is such a powerful authority that demons take notice of what's going on in us. Yes. Watch me. I'm going, I'm going somewhere with this uh, this morning. Because it's simple. It's simple. Until the church prays, until the church receives an unction from on high, we will not function. Yes. If we are going to function in the full-blown ministry of Jesus Christ, it begins in the place of prayer. Peter and the others got up the next morning after Jesus had ministered a, 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 an amazing day of healing and deliverance to a city. He had been made famous in a matter of hours in an entire city. Watch this. And so the next morning, uh, Peter... And the others get up and they're looking for him and they pursue him. And the reason they pursue him is because they say everyone is looking for you, Jesus. This struck me because what I begin to see here is that we must pursue Jesus like Simon did. We must have a spirit of pursuit to find him because everyone else is looking for him. Uh, you see, what we need to give the world today is Jesus. We got to get enough Jesus in us that we can give Jesus away to those around us. Jesus already gave himself away. He had to go and sit in the place of prayer until he could receive more unction of the Holy Spirit in his life. And Peter said, we are coming after you, Jesus, because everybody needs you. This is for one reason not that we must pursue God, that we can get enough of him in our life. Because believe it or not, the world is looking for an unadulterated presence of God. They're tired of religion. They're tired of us giving them something that doesn't mean anything and doesn't impact their world. But if we can get enough, if we can spend enough time with God until we are impacted by God, we can get up and then we can go and impact the world. Somebody say yes. But there will be no impact without power and there will be no power without prayer. No power without prayer. Everyone was looking for Jesus. You see, prayer is like the bomb of heaven. It just blows things up. It changes everything. I still believe in the power of prayer. Don't give up your prayer time for anything. Make it a priority in your life. Uh, because every time you pray, God plants a little more authority in your life that wherever you go, you can make a difference. You can walk in and you can explode with the love of Jesus and the power of Jesus and the authority of God. And you can change a situation in any moment. But it goes back to the place of prayer. Pursue him in the place of prayer. They were looking for Jesus. They were pursuing him. Where did they find him? Where did they find him? Praying. You know where you find him today? Praying. You go to the place of prayer, you'll find Jesus. Hebrews 7, 25, therefore, he is able to save the uttermost, those who come to him through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The word intercession means to stand in the gap. It means to cry out on somebody else's behalf. This we know, this has got two, uh, two ideas to it. Number one, it, Jesus is in the place of prayer, and he's crying out for the lost today, and he's crying out over your life today, that God is able, he's praying over us to get us through anything. He stands in the gap between us and God. He ever intercedes for us. But not only that, he stands in the gap as the righteous one. He stands in the gap as the savior of the world. He is the intercessor. So when the accuser of the brethren comes before the father and begins to belittle, begins to break us down, begins to criticize and ridicule us, Jesus stands between us and the accusation and says, no, Father, that is your child. That is your son. Loose your favor and blessing upon them. Somebody say yes. But if you want to find Jesus today, you find him in the place of prayer. Somebody shout prayer. So not only did Jesus pray. This is a real simple message today he preached. We just let the scripture teach us today. He preached. 
he preached. But he preached like no one else had ever preached. Mark 1 tells us that he preached with authority. He said, this is the reason I have come. Now, we know there are other reasons he came. But apparently, this was very important to the ministry of Jesus. He said, I have come for this purpose to preach. I've come to make a proclamation. Someone said, what's the difference between teaching and preaching? Somebody said, the volume. (laughs) Crank me up, baby, because I'm a preacher. In Mark 1, he said he went to the synagogue and he, and, he, and he taught. But he said he taught with authority like they had never seen before. This, this, this is so important, so important, because you see, if you learn how to pray alone, then you can preach with authority. Jesus had authority because he spent much time with his heavenly Father. And when he came out of the place of prayer and he went to the cities, he began to preach. And so obviously I'm thinking, well, I wonder what he preached. Because here in Mark 1, they said, who is this that comes with this authority and preaches a new doctrine? Preaches something we have not heard before. I'm telling you, the world is waiting for somebody to stand up and declare revelation over them. You see, that he said he preaches with authority, not unlike the scribes. The scribes, the scribes could only say what somebody else told them. They weren't full-blown rabbis. They weren't students of the word. They, only, they would only go and declare what the rabbi had told them to say. Uh, and so they were at best secondhand revelation of the things of God and the way who God was and the way God operated. And so they were sent out to, the, to these to synagogues. And so the scribe would get up and be dead, dry, leftover. Uh, stuff that they would even wasn't even passionate about and they would drone on and on and on and on uh, with laws and the traditions of men. Um, the Bible says they would lay burdens upon the people and so when the people came in uh, they would get burdens and weights put upon them uh, instead of being lifted up instead of being set free um, it laid stuff on them and weighted them down but this day Jesus shows up And he shows up and begins to preach uh, and make a proclamation of something that they had never heard before. And it got deep in their soul because he was speaking with authority. Somebody shout authority. Uh, The reason this is important for us today is that we we need a new voice of authority to speak to this generation. We need some people that will stand up and proclaim the same message that Jesus preached with authority to change a nation. Somebody say yes. So what did he preach? Well, if if you go to Mark chapter 1, verse 14, it said, Now after John was put... In prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is what Jesus, I believe here in in Mark chapter 1, when Jesus went into the synagogue that morning in Capernaum, this is what he was preaching. He was preaching the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Of God. Jesus was a revolutionary. Jesus wasn't following the status quo. He wasn't following the same line of teaching. He wasn't, he wasn't getting up in there and, and, and being dry and dead and lifeless. Because you understand, he came for this purpose to preach. And he didn't just come to preach any message. He came to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. He declared, he stood up and declared, time is fulfilled. Time is is fulfilled. What, what does that mean? Jesus said, this is the beginning of God time in history. God has stepped out of time and eternity, and he has come to declare a message over you whose time has come. He has been hidden in the mysteries of the prophets. But today I have come, and I preach the gospel of the kingdom. And when he said the time is fulfilled, he was saying, today it stands Fulfilled Today here, looking at me, watching me, hearing me, Jesus was proclaiming uh, his ministry was to fulfill the kingdom of God 
on the earth. Jesus announced an inauguration of a new era of salvation. Uh, he, he was declaring to them that, that if they, they could experience it, they could enter into it. If they repented and they believed, they could step into the very kingdom of God at this moment. Nobody else had ever said that. Anyone else that talked about the kingdom of God had made it something way, 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 way in the future. Oh, one day there would, God will come and he will establish his kingdom. There will be a Messiah. But Jesus stepped in and said, right now, I want you to know the kingdom of God is right here. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is repent. And the rule and the power of God will manifest over your life. Oh, this broke all the rules. This brought God near. This let them know salvation is more than a redemptive power. It is a ruling force in the earth. Somebody needs to hear that. So, so many of us, salvation is simply about redemption and forgiveness and restoration. It is that. But also understand it is about ruling. It is about taking dominion. Jesus said, I have not come here just to preach a redemptive message. I have come to release the rule of God into the earth now. Somebody shout now. And so when I, when I was thinking about that, I began to think about the, the response in church that Sunday. And that the Bible says there was a man of an unclean spirit, a demon-possessed man. They began to cry out. And he began to cry out against Jesus. He began to cry out about what he was teaching and he was proclaiming. You see, you have to understand this. Please, uh, we just got back from Africa, so demon possession is very real to me, probably more now than it was before I went. Even though I have dealt with demon-possessed people and I have cast out demonic spirits, it is a reality. I like what, what Sean, Evangelist Sean Smith said this week. He said, he said that the demons here in America just got more sophisticated, but they're here. And they do show up at church because that demon showed up at church. And obviously that demon had been there uh, every time they had church. He would come right up on in there and worship with them. And, and he would hear that old dry dead teaching. It didn't move him at all. It didn't shake him at all. But when Jesus showed up and began to preach the gospel of the kingdom and said, this ain't something that's afar off. This is something that is here right now. When he began to release that revelation, the demons began to cry out. The demons began to manifest. And of course, Jesus immediately told him to be quiet. Yet. The Bible says that me, our, our, our teachers say that means to muzzle him. He told him, be muzzled. You have no authority in here. And he cast the demon out of that man. You've got to understand something. Uh, when we were in Africa, man, the, when the kingdom of God manifest, I'm teaching this because I believe that God's getting ready to manifest his kingdom at a whole nother level in this house. And you better get ready because when the rule of God sets down on a place, there will be demons of religion that will come out against it, cry out against it. But we have authority over them to tell them to shut up, come out of that man, leave him alone. Uh, you got to understand what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to bring across to us uh, this morning. Because you see, uh, in Jesus' time, in Jesus' time, it was believed that one can, could gain control over another by speaking their name. And so when the demon-possessed man cried out, we know who you are, Jesus immediately shut it down. Because, number one, he doesn't need them to identify who he is. And he's not going to give up any glory, any praise, any attention to a demonic spirit. And so immediately he takes control over it. Y'all listen to me. And, and he tells it to be quiet. Because you have to understand, today, demons are more sophisticated. The reason they manifest so readily in Africa is they were a culture that's ready to accept it. They were very demonized people. It's a very dark place. But you, every night at, at the uh, festival, when Johannes, when Johannes would begin to pray the salvation prayer, after hundreds or thousands of people come forward, almost immediately when he began to talk about Jesus... And he began to talk about his lordship. Demons would begin to cry out. Demons would begin to manifest. And I'm not talking about one, two, three. I'm talking about 10, 20, 30. They have a demon tent. They're so used to this because they are used to, to loosening the kingdom of God, the rule of God, the authority of Christ wherever they go. And as they release the power of the gospel message, people would respond, even demon-possessed people 
would respond. But after they got up there and the glory of God came down and lordship was spoken over them, they would manifest and they would cry out. Y'all looking at me like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. You better get ready for that because I know we think we all sophisticated, but there are some demon-possessed people that need to be set free. And the only reason they're not manifesting yet is we haven't loosed the kingdom of God in its full power yet. But when the kingdom is released in full power, you see, what are we going to do? I tell you, we're going to do the same thing they did. We're going to grab them. We're going to carry them out somewhere, and we're going to cast that demon out of them. I don't know about you, but I would rather be sitting by somebody free than somebody that's got a demon on them. Yes? I know this is crazy. I know this messes people up in our little sophisticated religion. But the kingdom of God is not sophisticated. The kingdom of God is the rule and the power of God coming in in glory and demonstration. Yes? So he took authority over that thing because this is what I think here in America. Demons hide in the culture. They hide in the culture. What do you mean? I mean they, they act like the culture. And if we get a sophisticated spirit up in the church, and we're acting like they don't manifest and they're not real, and they're not controlling people's lives, come on, just watch the news. There's a reason these people do all these crazy things. There's a reason uh, that they kill and they rape. And they, they bring terror on people. And they, oh, they got, they're sick in their mind. They're sick in their soul. And there's a demon that's got a hold of them. And their only hope is somebody can bring the kingdom of God. Yes? And so he preached the kingdom. He preached the kingdom of God. And that demon became, ag- I'm so ready to agitate the devil. I'm so ready to agitate the spirit of religion. When you begin to talk about the kingdom of God, religious people walk out and they get all agitated and they get all mad. Uh, but see, when Jesus taught it, it lifted the weight off the hungry. It lifted the weight off of those that were pursuing God. It lifted the weight off of them. Uh, but it put a weight on religion until it had to manifest and cry out. You spirit of religion, cry out if you want. But I cast you out in the name of Jesus. I'm ready to see the kingdom manifest. Somebody shout the kingdom. Real quickly, there's three aspects to the kingdom of God uh, for for us to really understand the fullness of it. Number one, it it is first the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom of Christ. What we see here in Mark and through the gospels is the kingdom in Christ. What I mean by that is the kingdom and the power were present in his person and in the ministry of Jesus the King. Our Bible says in Luke 20, Luke 20, excuse me, Luke 11. You got that? Luke 11. My bad. I got my stuff all messed up here. No? Jesus said, but if I cast out demons with the finger of God, Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. He said, if I cast it out with a finger, surely the ki-. See, demons and oppressive spirits can't stay in the same place as the kingdom of God. Jesus carried the kingdom in him. So everywhere he went, they cried out. And they tried to take authority over him. But he would not let them. He would not let them cry out and say his name. Why? Because his name is the name that is above every name. And every demonic power will bow to the name of Jesus. Somebody say yes. yes. Secondly, the kingdom, the, king, the second aspect you need to understand of the kingdom of God is that the kingdom is in the church today. It was in Christ, but now the kingdom is in the church. The kingdom is in, and, and that's found in Luke, Luke uh, chapter 17, uh, verse 20 and 21. It says, now when he had asked When he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God today is within the church. Uh, This involves a present manifestation of God's rule and power in our hearts. Do you really want to expand the kingdom of God? Do you really want to advance the kingdom of God? You do it one heart at a time. Because every time somebody turns from darkness to light, uh, everybody turns from sin to God, the kingdom of God is manifested in their heart. The kingdom of God is manifested within them. And the kingdom of God is expanded one soul at a time. Somebody shout yes. 
And so the presence of the kingdom comes with great power. And when it comes, this is why I'm saying I believe God wants to increase the manifestation of his kingdom over our lives and over this house. It's because when it comes, it asserts itself in dominion. The kingdom does. Over Satan, over sin, over evil. Uh, it is a powerful force and presence uh, that, that begins to activate the church to do the ministry of Jesus Christ. Which is preach the gospel of the kingdom. Why am I saying that? Because the gospel is not word only, but power. And when the gospel of the kingdom is released, signs and wonders follow. Lives are changed. Lives are saved. Lives are delivered. Healing is manifest when the kingdom is released. And so obviously I'm not just talking about me standing behind this, this pulpit or Pastor Kim or some others standing behind this pulpit preaching. I'm talking about you have been called and anointed to proclaim the kingdom of God everywhere you go. You have been called to walk up any, any situation and release the anointing and the power of God of joy, of righteousness, and of peace. You have been called to stir up religious spirits. You have been called to walk into places and let demons. You know, there's a missionary in our movement today and I can't I can't remember he's somewhere way up in North Africa I can't remember exactly where he's at it's a very Muslim nation that he is in and it, 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 I mean a real a real stronghold that you can be killed there for naming the name of Jesus if you say you're a Christian they'll kill you if you say you're a Christian they'll put you in jail but God has called them there obviously he kind of works uh, underground, and he's making a huge impact there. But many times they will go into places, and because the kingdom of God is upon them, demons will begin to cry out. They don't say anything, they don't do anything, but demons will begin to cry out. And when these demons cry out, all they can do is get and turn away and walk out because if they begin to cast them out in the name of Jesus, they blow their cover. Are you hearing what I'm talking about? It's time we get the kingdom of God up on us and in us to the point that wherever we go, captives can be set free. Somebody say yes. This is what Jesus did. And then the last, the last aspect of the kingdom is what we call the kingdom in the consummation. Which, which is at the end of time, when time ceases and we move into eternity. Uh, our, our Bible says in Revelation 11, in Revelation 11, uh, chapter, uh, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 5, it declares uh, to us, then, he, then the seven, seventh, and, uh, the angel, excuse me, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Today the kingdom is spiritual. There will be one day when there will be a manifestation. And all the nations shall bow before Jesus the Lord. And shall declare that he is king of all. Amen. And his kingdom shall be established, and we, the church, will rule, and we will reign with him forever and ever. Somebody shout, we win. That's the kingdom of God today. So Jesus, he, he understood the power of praying alone. He understood the power of preaching with authority. He understood how, what it meant uh, to, to uh, declare the things of God. Oh, how we need a voice. Oh, how I pray over you that God will move you beyond secondhand revelation until you begin to have a revelation of his word, until you begin to have a revelation of his gospel, until you begin to have a revelation that burns like fire shut up in your bones, that when you speak, it, it won't like you will not be saying Pastor Paul says you'll be saying the word of God says somebody say yes that's why this book should never grow old right here obviously your Bible is your most important aspect of knowing the things of God but this book right here you should read it over and over and over and over don't read it one time and said I've been through it read it until you almost have it memorized read it until you can stand and declare everything in this over somebody else's life because when the word is preached faith is released somebody say yes yes and the last thing that we see here the last thing we see here in Mark chapter 1 is that after Jesus had prayed and he had preached, he poured out. He poured out. It said fame. Jesus was made famous because everyone in the city was talking about how he had delivered the man, the demon-possessed man, and how he had healed 
uh, Peter's mother-in-law. Because, you see, Jesus, this is amazing to me, Jesus' ministry began that morning in church, moved from church to Peter's house. And it said, as the sun went down, they began to bring the sick. They begin to bring the demonized, those who are under oppressive spirits, those who have bondages in their life and they cannot get free. They may not even be full-blown possessed, but they're oppressed by demonic powers. They're helpless. They're hopeless. They've tried everything to get free, and they can't see. See, when someone can't get free from something, there's a good chance a demon has manifested around them. I know we don't hear preaching like this anymore, but just because you don't talk about it don't mean they don't go away. They just empowered when we shut up. Hmm? And so, so, the, so they were bringing all of these people. They were, they, they were desperate people. Desperate people. And they all began to come to Peter's house as the sun went down. You know why? Because the Sabbath had ended. I mean, this was so powerful to me. See, when people finally come to the end of religion, and they will look for a relationship. They will look for a God that can step down in their life. They will look for a Jesus that has the power. They wanted to know, we heard Jesus was made famous in our city today. We heard that he he set the demonic free. We heard that he healed Peter's mother. We heard that Jesus is a healer of sick bodies. And it said they begin to come to Peter's house. I want you to know God can take a simple place and turn it into a place that changes lives. Oh, y'all better hear me right now. And, and, and Mark 2, it says later on he came back to Capernaum and they heard he was Jesus was in the house. And the house was so filled with people and they couldn't even get beyond the door. The idea is this. Peter's house was probably two-story. It probably housed an entire family, his, his family, his wife, his children, his mother-in-law, his brother. All their families probably lived in one huge house, two stories. Uh, and, and it had a, a big fence uh, around it, and it had a gate or a door, they called it. And they could let multitudes of people into this area. And from there, Jesus ministered the gospel of the kingdom. He no longer preached, but he poured out. He no longer stood and said the kingdom has come. He said, let me show you what it's like when you touch the kingdom of God. And many of them lined up. The city gathered at the door. Why? Because on the other side of the door was freedom. On the other side of the door was healing. On the other side of the door was transformation. Nobody nobody is ever going to convince me that if we ever get the full manifestation of the kingdom of the gospel in this house, you won't be able to get the people in here. You won't be able to keep them away. If they know if I step in there, I'm going to be healed. If I step in there, I'm going to be set free. Somebody shout, yes. So Jesus, who who walked in this great authority, made himself available. I think this may be the missing link today. Is much of the church is chasing after authority, spiritual authority. But we're not available. Jesus had an amazing ministry in the church. But Jesus also had an amazing ministry in in the house. And he also had amazing ministry in the street. Jesus was very available. He was available to heal the sick. He was available to set the captive free. Are we available? That's even more than just giving God time. That's do we have the faith? Do we have the faith to pray the prayer of faith? Are we available to pray over the sick because we believe they can be healed? Are we available to pray over those that are are in deep, deep bondage because we believe Jesus can set them free? Are we available? Are we available? Are we available for us to our church? See, I come to tell you because if we're going to fulfill the ministry of Jesus, we must understand the place of prayer. We must understand how to seek God alone. If nobody else will seek him, I will seek him. I will find him. I will pursue him. I will get the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit on my life. I will let God plant authority in me. And then I will get up and, and I will declare the kingdom of the gospel. And I will say, yes. And equivocally, Jesus can heal the sick. Jesus can set the captive 
free and make myself available that I will pour out. It said from the evening on to the rest of the night, Jesus laid hands on them all, all that was brought to him. Who was outside of the gate? Who was outside of the door? Who was out there? I tell you, who was out there, the desperate. The desperate were out there. And those who brought the desperate were gathered at the door. So I just wanted to release this vision over you because I'm feeling something very strong deep in my spirit today. That we need to be poured out. We need to make ourselves available. See, power is available today. I believe the question of, of, our, of our culture and our city today is they want to know. They want to know, can Jesus help me? Can Jesus really help me? If I come to him, can he really change my life? Can he really forgive me? Can he really redeem my life? Can he really heal my sick body? Can he really set me free? Can he really break the power of drug addiction and sexual addictions? And can he really, really break the power of addiction off my life? Can he set me free? Can he really do it? I know he did it in the Bible, but will he do it today? I believe he will if the church will make him available. I said if we will make him available. Yes. You see, miracles shout, Jesus is in the house. I can preach until I'm blue in the face. That means nothing. But when miracles begin to manifest, they can say, Jesus is in the house. I want to get Jesus up in this house at a whole nother level. I want to get Jesus in this house. Not just I feel him in my worship, but I want to see Jesus in the house where his presence releases power and the sick begin to be healed. Are y'all hearing me? And demons begin to cry out and addictions and chains and lives are changed in his presence. Somebody shout yes. Would you stand all over the house, please? Jesus poured out. See, the word available, available, the word avail means to be used to have a force to help. Look, there ain't no doubt God can do anything. There's no doubt that the ministry of Jesus is, uh, am I right? That the ministry of Jesus should be continued on through his church today. That's us to our generation. Is that right? Then, my friend, then, my friend, then, then we should avail his power in any situation. We should avail his power. The word avail means to be used to make a force to help. It means the effective use in the achievement of a goal. Jesus has a goal today. To seek and save those that are lost. He has a goal today. To heal broken bodies. You see, why, 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 why does this even happen? Because you got to understand today that God's purpose for working miracles is to demonstrate his love and his power to an unchurched world and then to destroy the works of the enemy. This is where the power of the Holy Spirit comes in because you see we must avail, we must be available. Available. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. See, I wanted to try to awaken us uh, this morning and let you know Jesus is still able. What he did in the Gospels and what he did through the book of Acts Church, he wants to do through your life. He wants to do through my life. I refuse to become sophisticated in church. When there is a world that aches to be healed in their soul. I want you to lift your hands all over this room. Jesus poured out that day. There are many ways to increase spiritual authority, but I believe one way is when you make yourself available authority comes. When I'm willing to pray the prayer of faith, authority comes. When I'm willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, authority comes. We're going to have to begin to kind of push ourselves a little bit. Get back to the place 
where we ask people, can I pray with you? And let's see what God will do. Because when you reach out and you begin to pray, I think authority comes. Authority to heal. Authority to deliver. Authority. Jesus said, I give it unto you. He told his disciples, I give you all authority. Heal the sick. Cast out devils. It ain't changed. And the work of the enemy and the lives of people haven't changed. So with those hands lifted, I want to release something over you. I want to release a fresh revelation of authority and ability, availability. That I believe today that if each one of us will take this to our sphere of influence, Jesus will be all over our city. People will gather at the doors of your house. They heard Jesus was there. They will gather at the doors of this house. We heard Jesus is there. I heard if I step in your building, I can be healed. I can be delivered. My life can be changed forever. I just want you to know today. God's releasing an anointing over you. You have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I speak over you and I say, don't settle for miracle-free Christianity any longer. Don't settle for status quo. There are those that preach it. There are those that teach it. There are those that have settled for it. But I come to tell you in this house, I free you up to do the ministry of Jesus. I free you up to do what Jesus would do if he walked in the city today. I free you up. I send you out. I send you out. I send you out. I send you out today. I send you out today. We're going to go out. We're going we're gonna to touch the city. We're going to do it together. We're going to do it everywhere we go. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to fill the streets with the doctrine of Jesus. Lives are going to be changed. Lives are going to be changed. I send you out today. Just put those, head, those hands down, every eye closed. Let me talk to those this morning that need Jesus. I want you to know Jesus is the real deal. I can't offer you change because I can't change you, but I can offer you Jesus, and Jesus can change you. I can offer you a relationship with him today. See, the other reason Jesus came was to be the Savior of the world. And 2,000 years ago, he went to a cross and he died for you and I because sin demands death. But so we wouldn't have to die to sin. Jesus died for us. And he got up so we could live today. And that we could have eternal life. That we could have relationship with our Creator. The only way to get to the Father is through the Son, Jesus. Yes, he even declared, I am the door. I am the door. Step through me into eternal life. I don't know what your life is like today, and maybe it's messed up, and maybe you're ready for something new, something different, something, a fresh start maybe, huh? Maybe you've seen Jesus change somebody else's life, and you think, man, I need that in my life. I need to be changed. I need the power of God, the presence of God over my life today. I need to experience his love, his forgiveness. I'm telling you, don't leave here without receiving his forgiveness. So before we dismiss this morning, I just want to make sure that everyone in this house is right with God and you're ready for eternity. The Bible says that death comes to us all and then the judgment. I want to make sure you're ready for eternity and I want to make sure you're empowered for this life you're living right now. I want to invite you to Jesus today. I want to invite you to pray a prayer with me that begins a journey with Jesus Christ. It's called a fresh start prayer. And so if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I need that. I need a fresh start. I need a relationship with God. 
I'm ready to put my faith in Jesus as my Savior, my personal Savior. I want you to just throw your hand up right now. Anyone in this building? Yeah? Anyone else? Just put your hand up. Anyone else? See, that's me. I need Jesus today. Yes, I see that. Anyone else? Come on. Come on. Yes? Okay. Anyone else today? I need Jesus today. I need Jesus today. I'm ready to receive him. I'm ready to put my faith in him. I want everybody in this room to say this prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, I need you. Today, I believe that you are the Savior of the world. And right now, I make you my personal Savior. Jesus, forgive me of all my sin. Jesus, give me a fresh start. Today, I thank you for accepting me where I am and for changing me forever. Amen. I think I saw two different hands go up. There may have been more. But if you prayed that prayer with me, I would love so much to be able to meet you. And I want to ask you to do something right now because you know what? This is the thing about serving Jesus. You can't be ashamed. He wasn't ashamed to hang up for us. We shouldn't be ashamed to stand up for him. And so if you, re- if you prayed that prayer, you raised your hand, or maybe you didn't raise your hand a while ago, but you prayed that prayer for the first time in your life or maybe for the first time in a long time and you're coming back to Jesus and you're coming back to start again and, 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 and to live for him and to walk this journey, I'm going to ask you to do something bold and courageous because this is what the world needs. They need people that are bold and courageous for Jesus. I'm going to ask you to come join me right here. I'm going to step down off this, this stage right now. And I'm going to ask you to come right here. I know there was at least two, but there may be more. Church, I want you to put your hands together and clap for them. They're coming right now. Welcome them. Awesome. Welcome home, buddy. Come right here. So good. Just stand right here. What's your name? Jessica. Nice to meet you, Jessica. Huh? Huh? Yes, Jordan. And your name, honey? Marissa. All three of you may come back to Jesus today or receive Jesus as your Savior today. That's so awesome. Before we pray, why don't you just turn to the person next to you and just say, hey, do you want to go up there? You might as well start working on your delivery right now. Just ask them. Just, y'all just stay right here. You want, you want, I'll walk with you. Tell them, I'll go with you. I'll take you to Jesus. They brought people to Jesus. Don't be ashamed to bring people to Jesus. Where are you going, Jessica? Okay, go get them. I like that. I like that. That's awesome. See, awesome. See, this, this, is what, this is part of what we did in Africa. When we were on the streets, and they would preach, and people would raise their hands, but then they would ask them to come forward, and maybe nobody would come forward. Our job was to go grab them and bring them to Jesus. Amen? That's awesome. What's your name, buddy? Anthony? Oh, come here, buddy. Jesus loves you so much. Awesome. Amen. Well, we've already prayed the fresh start prayer, but I just want to say a prayer over you, okay? Oh, what's your name? Have I met you before, Taylor? I thought so. You look familiar. It's been a while. Too long, huh? What? A year? I don't know how you can stay away from me that long, buddy. <laughs> awesome. Praise God. All right. All right, guys. Reach your hands out. Reach your hands out. Jesus, I thank you so much today for your love. And I thank you you loved each one of these so much you brought them here today. And you just want to reveal your love to them, your grace to them. You just want to change them forever. So, Lord, I seal what just took place these last few moments. Because, Lord, you are the Redeemer. You are the Savior. Holy Spirit, quicken their spirits alive to you right now like never before. And I say, enemy, you cannot have one of them in Jesus' name. But they belong to Jesus now. And I thank you just for loving them and changing them forever. Y'all look at me. Here at Fresh Start Church, obviously we believe in a fresh start. 
But not only that, we believe also in finishing strong. And we want to help you do that. Okay? We want to help you finish this journey with Jesus strong. Because it's a, it's, it's a journey. You're just beginning today. But it's an exciting, exciting thing. And so what I'm going to ask you to do right now is go right over here. to see that pursuit banner right there? And a couple of our pastors are, are, will meet you right over there. And we have what we call a fresh start bag. And there's a, a, a New Believer's Bible in there and some other information that kind of explains what just took place in your life. Maybe a little clearer than we were able to do this morning. And also we have a fresh start class every Sunday morning. It begins at what time? 8.30? Yeah, 8.30. And Pastor Sean right over there, he teaches that class. And I encourage you to be a part of that class. You can start next Sunday. And uh, it just really empowers you and, and, and gives you revelation and understanding, all right? So you can get strong in the Lord. So you can finish this thing. Because it's easy to start. Sometimes it's hard to finish, but we're here to help you. Okay? So if y'all go right over there right now, they'll be right over there and they'll help you. Come on, church. Give them one more big hand clap. That's awesome. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Yeah, you guys run over there. So good. So good. So good. All right. Uh, listen, let me just say this real quick, and then we'll be, we'll be done this morning. Um, you know, Pastor Rosalinda has been, she mentioned it, they've been going over to Varney Park uh, once a month, doing a ministry over there and getting a lot of kids out there and ministering to the children. And um, we're getting ready to take that up a notch. And what I mean by that is we're going to begin to do outreach with her. We're going to join with her and partner with her. And uh, we want to we wanna take drama teams. We want to take dance teams. We want to be able to set up a sound system. We're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ there. Amen. And just believe this. People are going to get saved right there on the streets. Amen. Believe people are going to get healed right there on the streets. Believe demons are going to have to let loose right there on, amen, right there on the streets. So we do pretty good in here, but it's time to take it out there. Amen. So y'all be listening so we can do it together. All right. Somebody say, yeah, let's do this. Amen. Success to you. Success to the king and his kingdom. God bless you.